Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today, I would like to touch upon a topic which <laughs> when I first saw it was, was a bit confusing. It, it's one of those definitions um, where you just think, why should I care? Um, well, strictly speaking, I'm also going to talk about subgroups, but um, the definition of a subgroup is not very surprising. It's a substructure, you have a group. Uh, you would come up with the definition of a subgroup yourself very quickly. No, well, my main focus today will be on what is a normal subgroup. And why should I care that there is a difference between a subgroup and a normal subgroup? And as I said, at least for me, the definition of a normal subgroup fall a little bit out of the, out of the blue, out of the sky. And it wasn't quite clear to me why I should care. And I always get confused between subgroups and normal subgroups and everything. So maybe this video helps. Uh, some people to not get confused anymore. In some sense, at least, I, I'm still getting confused, by the way, <laughs> but uh, that shouldn't stop you from trying to understand normal subgroups. So the whole point, and this is kind of a general philosophy that you will see, um, is substructures might not be the right thing to consider if you want to take quotients. For vector spaces, actually, there is no difference. So substructures, what, what is a substructure for a vector space? It would be a linear subspace. It's exactly the definition is exactly built to be uh, the one of a substructure. Turns out that if you want to take quotients, it's also the right structure. And what do I mean by take quotients? Well, you want to identify information. That's always the idea of taking quotients. And whatever comes out should have an induced structure uh, from the from so it, it it should inherit the structure from uh, the bigger one where you start, right? Of course, I could just take some quotient of a vector space and then just use some linear structure on the quotient. That's not what we want to do, right? The linear structure on the quotient should come from the vector space you started with, um, and it turns out that the only thing you need to ensure that this is true is well, already a substructure, a linear subspace. For groups and for other objects like rings, as we see later, or not today anymore, certainly, but in, in some video, it, it should probably come. Um, for groups, the natural notion of a group, I shouldn't use blue. Um, the natural no notion of a group is a subgroup, but uh, yeah, the natural notion of a group is a subgroup. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Brain. The natural notion of a substructure is a subgroup, and the natural notion of uh, to have a good quotient is the one of the normal subgroup. And that's the whole point. So sometimes substructures do not give good quotients. And that's where uh, the notion of a, um, of, a, of a normal subgroup comes from. The notion of, a, as I said, the notion of a subgroup will not, will not be a big shock. It will not be very surprising. Um, alternatively, and that's something to keep in mind, there's a different motivation, which it is actually the way you would like to think about it, but it, it, it kind of also comes a little bit out of the blue because you need to know kind of what are, what are the right maps between groups. And the right maps between groups are, of course, group homomorphisms, right? F of AB is F of A, F of B where I always write my groups multiplicatively unless they are something like Z mod N. Very inconsistent, oh, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so group homomorphisms are certainly the right morphisms between um, groups because they preserve the structure. And you observe then that subgroups are actually the images of group homomorphisms. Why, uh, in contrast, the normal subgroups are exactly the kernels of group homomorphisms. It's kind of a way of to think about it. Here's a picture. So here I have my group G, um, and I stole this picture, I'll link in the, in the description. Um, I have my group G, and the kernel is actually a normal subgroup. It's this one here. So these are all, the kernel is just, are just all elements that are mapped under F to the identity over here. And you will realize that the kernel, well, it's, it's a nice subgroup, but it's conjugates by group elements. Uh, are then mapped also in exactly the same way to, well, conjugates down here. 
So what happens is actually the kernel has this structure, has this extra structure under um, kind of group conjugation, or in, in this case, group translation. You just act by a group element on your, um, on your kernel. And you get kind of the same image translated, right? A group in some sense acts by translations. And it turns out that, okay, in, in this case, my map F is subjective. And if the map is subjective, then actually, um, the, uh, the image is isomorphic to G mod kernel, and kernel is exactly the normal subgroup. And that's how you construct normal subgroups. And that's how they arise naturally. Right? You take a group homomorphism, and you observe that the kernel is kind of translated by group elements, and that gives you the notion of a normal subgroup. Um, here's a fun example. So, uh, so the set of all isometries, oh, this was really bad. The set of all isometries, which I denote by En, let me get rid of it. So En is uh, the group of all isometries, the Euclidean, the Euclidean group, the group of all isometries of, uh, well, let's say R to the N. So here in this case, N is two, of course, that's the only one I can really, <laughs> that I can really um, display on the slide, maybe N equals three, but, you know, right? It's low low dimensions are usually good. N equals one is usually a bit too boring. Uh, I'm waffling. So let's go on. So this is Euclidean. And what are Euclidean eyes? What are isometries? So rotations, reflections, translations. And if you think about it a little bit, if you get rid of the translations, then actually, so T is my set, my notation for translations, then actually what comes out is an orthogonal group. So translations would move the origin. And the orthogonal group is, well, let's say rotations and reflections, which keeps the origin. Right? It's kind of kind of obvious. Um, not obvious in the really strict sense, but a kind of intuitively obvious that if you get uh, take all uh, isometries, all length preserving um, isometries of Rn, which include translations. And you get rid of the translations, then you're kind of stuck to the origin. And what remains are exactly, well, the, the orthogonal transformations. And you can see this. And this is, again, why um, there should be a corresponding notion of, uh, of, a, of a normal subgroup, because Tn actually is a normal subgroup in En. So let's have a look what this actually means in this case. Well, I claim the following. If you first move, that is the translation, let's call it T. Then you rotate, that is a rotation, call it R, and then you move back, which is T inverse. Then, oh, this is T inverse. Then you do not get a rotation. And this is saying that rotations do not form a normal subgroup of, of, of the Euclidean group. So let's have a look. Um, so the, the thing in the background is just to help you to, to locate where everything is happening. So this thing in the background stays fixed. So in the first step, I move my, 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 my symbol by a translation. Then as you can see, I rotate a little bit and then, um, then I actually move it back. And moving it back is just this arrow, well, almost, which I'm copying now. Um, moving it back, oops. Uh, I don't want this anymore. Okay. Then, well, let's have a look. I move, I rotate, I move back, and obviously this is not a rotation anymore. I mean, it is rotated, but not a rotation along the origin. Right? The origin is in the, in the center of my hexagon. This is not a rotation along the origin. Funnily, if you do it the other way around, if you move, if you rotate and rotate back, and rotate back, it actually gives you a translation. And this conjugation property is what, in the end, defines a, a normal subgroup. So Tn should be a normal subgroup. Here's a conjugation property. And yeah, um, so this is not T, but this is T prime. OK, this is equal to T prime for some other translation. And this is called conjugation. So let's have a look. You rotate, you translate, and you rotate back. And indeed, it's a translation. It's not this translation. It's a rotated translation. It's kind of this translation, but still it is a translation. And that amounts to say in the end that Tn is a normal subgroup of En. Okay, so let's wrap up. 
So um, a subgroup is exactly what you think it is. It's, it's a subset that, that is compatible with the induced multiplication in the sense that it again forms a group. Okay, not, not very exciting. A normal subgroup and note the difference between the notation. Normal subgroups usually are, are denoted by this um, triangle symbol while subgroups are just denoted by the usual inclusion. Anyway, a normal subgroup is a subgroup Okay, yeah, sure, which is invariant under conjugation. And invariant under conjugation is exactly what I said. And there are basically two equivalent formulations, um, right? You can, you, here's a G inverse, you can G pull the G inverse to this side by multiplying by G and you would get this formulation. And here's a picture. So uh, a normal subgroup is invariant under, let's say, right or left action by, uh, by G. And this is really, <laughs> there are almost no, there are really almost no um, non-trivial, uh, sorry, there are almost no normal subgroups in, in, in usually. They are pretty rare compared to subgroups. So the symmetric group S5, here's my example, um, has, if I not miscounted, double check in the link in the description actually, um, which links to a very nice page, which is, which is a Wikipedia for groups, for finite groups in particular, and you can basically find any information you want to know about a small finite group, you, you can find it there. Like number of non-conjugate subgroups of S5, symmetric group in five letters. If I'm not, if I haven't miscounted on that page, then there should be 17 of them, not counting the two trivial ones. So S, I don't want to count S5, I don't want to count the trivial uh, subgroup, but uh, non-trivial ones, you would count 17. And this has just one, it has just one a non-trivial normal subgroup, which is the alternating group. So, and while this number grows really, really fast, um, symmetric groups never have more than one normal sub, non-trivial, of course, again, uh, well, not more than non-trivial normal subgroups. So normal subgroup is really kind of a restricted notion, but it comes up naturally if you think about examples coming from um, geometry, I will show you another example coming from geometry in a second, if you think about kernels or if you think about quotients. In particular, if you would just write down what it means for a quotient group to, to have a group structure, would end up exactly with this, with this property of being invariant at a conjugation. Um, okay, so let's wrap up by looking at a fun example. So A4, um, which is a rotational symmetry group of a tetrahedron. I will show you Mathematica in a second which, which uh, gives you moving pictures of those. And, okay, and I want to show you normal and abnormal subgroups of, of this, uh, of A4, of this rotational symmetries of the tetrahedron, where abnormal is certainly not the standard word, but I, I think you get the pun, <laughs> whatever. Um, the point is, um, now the rotational symmetries of the tetrahedron, what I can do is I can stick my rotation axis through a vertex, then it comes on, out on the other side through a face. I call this uh, the axis vertex face. And I have four of them because I have four vertices. And um, yeah, you will see this in action in a second. And it turns out uh, it's pretty easy to see that because you can uh, use the other operations to move the, uh, to move the faces around actually those four subgroups, which are isomorphic to Zmod mod three, it's just a rotation of the triangle, you'll see it in action in a second, are abnormal. They can't be normal. They are, they are exactly of this form. They are, um, you take one of them and you translate by G, but it's not the same as if you would translate it in the opposite direction. And you can see this geometrically. Um, similarly, if you take, if you use your axis and you just hit right through a um, through an edge and you come out on the other side again, kind of on the opposite edge, and you have three of them because you have six edges and you they always come in pairs, so you have three of them of those edge edge axes. Um, same count basically gives you that, or same argument gives you three conjugate subgroups, um, which are isomorphic to Z mod two, which are abnormal. So they're not normal because, again, of the same problem that this doesn't hold. Okay. 
But, and I leave that as a visualization exercise, I'll show you Mathematica in a second. If you combine these, then you actually get a normal subgroup. And now I encourage you to click on the link in the description to check whether these are all the um, uh, subgroups of A4. Uh, again, in the, in the group wiki, you can, you, you can easily check that. And I hope I did it correct. <laughs> let's see. Um, anyway, so let's go to Mathematica. So here's Mathematica. And um, as you can almost see, this is a tetrahedron. I will turn the picture in a second. Um, and I can arrange the angle of my rotation here. Okay, and this is what is going to happen. You see it from the top now. Let me turn the picture, maybe then it's a bit clearer. So here's my axis. And as I said, I want to stick it through a vertex and it comes out on the opposite face, as you can see, right? And the rotation is exactly doing this. Let's count. One, two, three. So this is my Z mod three. And if you think about it a little bit, then there is this opposite rotation, which would, or a rotation al along a different axis, which would take the bottom to any of the other three, which gives, which, which, well, so this is a subgroup of order three. But you can, as I said, take the bottom to any of the other three faces, which also changes the vertex to any of the other three vertices. And you get a conjugate subgroup, which is not uh, the same. So it's not normal. This subgroup is not normal. Similarly, if you do this thing, so as I said before, this goes through an edge and to, to the opposite edge, you will see that this is in Z mod two. So let's have a look. Uh, one and around again, two. And again, you can conjugate. So I have now, as you can see here, six pairs. So this one here in the front, which you see right now, is paired with uh, this one here in the back, and so on. So you have three pairs of double edges here, and they all generate the Z mod two things one, two. And they're all conjugate, so they're not normal. Another visualization exercise, I hope that's pretty clear. Another visualization exercise, if you could combine those here, so those three, this subgroup and all the three conjugates to a subgroup of the symmetry group, of the rotational symmetry group of, of the tetrahedron, then you would get a normal subgroup. Visualization exercise. Yeah, uh, anyway, let me say it again. Have a look at the uh, page in the description um, where all normal and subgroups of A4 are actually listed. And the whole point is not that's really A4. Well, A4 is nice. It's a symmetry group of that region. But the point is that the web page is really nice. And whenever you have to look for some property of some finite group, you will definitely find it there. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, I, um, that's it for today. And um, I hope I made the point clear that uh, normal subgroups do not completely fall out of the sky. They are motivated by quotients, they are motivated by ideals, and they are motivated by geometry. Although they look a little bit strange and weird if you see them for the first time. While, at least in my opinion, maybe I could have invented subgroups myself in some sense, right? I couldn't have invented normal subgroups myself. They are a little bit more mysterious. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.